Hi, you're listening to Hear This Idea, a podcast showcasing new thinking from top academics at the University of Cambridge and beyond. In this episode, we talk to Dr. Victoria Bateman. Dr. Bateman is a fellow in economics at Gondolin Keys College, Cambridge. Her research encompasses economic history, macroeconomics, and feminism, all of which we touch upon in this episode. We begin by laying out why the Industrial Revolution was so important and why understanding its causes is key to understanding modern economic growth. We hear Dr. Bateman explain the range of arguments people have given for why it was Britain that became the first industrialized nation in the world, before delving into her own research about why she believes fertility was a critical aspect to this that often gets neglected. We then draw out what lessons this has for developing countries today, particularly the links between female empowerment and economic growth. I think many people outside of economics often undervalue just how important the Industrial Revolution was and how many relevant lessons it still offers. Dr. Bateman is really excellent at summarising the literature and conveying her own ideas that are often left out in mainstream debate. So hopefully listeners can gain much value from this. So without any further ado, here's the episode. Um, What was it that drew you to economics and to economic history more more generally? So uh, probably the question... Um, why are some countries rich and so many others still poor? And it's one of those questions that once you start to think about it, you really can't think about anything else, to quote um, one notable economist. Um, It's a question that if we can find the right answers, um, then it gives us the power to unlock millions of people from poverty across the world today. So it's a question I'm not saying I yet have the full answers to, but why are some countries rich and so many others still poor is one that drove me to economics and in particular to economic history. And I think that's actually a very interesting kind of like um, leap of logic, because when people think about improving people's lives, um, we often think about the future. Yes. But what is it that kind of makes you look into the past instead to get answers? Yeah. So I grew up in the north of England. I grew up in Manchester, actually East Manchester, a town called Oldham that had been in many ways on top of the world in the Industrial Revolution. Um, And when I was growing up in the 1980s and 1990s, it was experiencing severe deindustrialization. And with that came a lot of economic uncertainty and a lot of social unrest too, including race riots whilst I was away at university. So my own background is growing up in an area that had been uh, very wealthy at one point in time and then had experienced decline. And so I... I saw the way in which the fate of economies could change quite dramatically over time. And, uh, and that really got me interested in looking at the, the deep, long-run factors that drive poverty and prosperity. And I think what's particularly interesting about uh, Britain is for much of history, we were a backwater. You know, we were in that category of poverty, a tiny little island on the edge of a region Europe, (laughs) that was itself a backwater to human civilization. And the fact that Britain went from that situation to being the richest economy in the world in the 1800s is something that really fascinated me. And to some extent could give us hope today, you know, for poor economies today, um, that might feel themselves similarly as backwater places. But if Britain could do it, then surely that means that other countries Mm. can do it too. That's that's really interesting. And I guess that kind of flows in naturally to the question as well about what makes the Industrial Revolution so special and why yeah. particularly studying Britain um, in the 1760 to 1850 kind of period. Yeah. Um, and what is it that makes this um, time period so interesting for economic historians compared to anything else? Yeah. So the Industrial Revolution in Britain, um, which really revolved around the north of England where I grew up, is seen as the classic beginning of the modern sustained economic growth that has brought us to where we are today. You know, the feeling is amongst economic historians that that was the time, so in the late uh, 1700s and early 1800s, when the economy first started to experience sustained year-on-year economic growth and has continued to do with some small exceptions, a few years of of bust, but in general, we've continued along that upward path ever since. Now, looking back over the long span of human history, there have been other periods of growth. There have been other episodes when economies have flourished for some time, but they have typically then stagnated 
um, and their fortunes have, have turned around. Um, so there is something interesting about this more recent period of the Industrial Revolution and how it's fed through to, to where we are today. I think that's a, a really interesting point, and it kind of runs into a lot of what um, Malthus uh, mm. talked about as well in the past, yes. about um, kind of playing to that idea that for most of human history, yeah. life really was nasty, brutish, and sure, mm. and that kind of all changed yeah. um, with the Industrial Revolution. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. And um, as I say, I mean, you do have countries or regions that manage to get growth going, but then there would be various factors that would pull growth back down, pull the standard of living back down with it. And one of those is population pressure. So historically, what would happen as an economy grew is as the economy grew, then population would grow with it and outstrip eventually the economic resources and lead to rising food prices and with it starvation and um, a, a population collapse. But other things too, environmental problems. And, and I think it's something we need to take more notice of today when you look back at economies in the past and how um, where they experienced growth, but then that resulted in pollution and mounting environmental problems that then soon put an end to their growth. And you see that, for example, in China's economic history. So historically, China was one of the wealthier parts of the world and on the back of that wealth its population started to expand and as its population expanded you saw forests being cut down and with that you see environmental degradation the silting up of rivers that then affected market connections and and, and inland trade um, so I think population pressures environmental problems and another thing vested interests so as economies grow and change groups that are initially quite powerful can be outcompeted by other groups. So a, a, a particular sector or a technology that might be bringing in lots of money might then become obsolete. And of course, the vested interest of the owners of that technology or the people working in that sector is to try and stop the economy advancing from there to stop themselves becoming obsolete. So you do sometimes see as the economy grows the buildup of these vested interests, including political ones that put sand in the wheels of further economic change and growth. So those things, politics, um, political vested interests, um, population pressure, and the environment have quite regularly brought an end to some of those older, more historic episodes of growth. Um, but in the case of the Industrial Revolution, we've managed to continue right through to the present day. Mm. Although it might also be a, a warning sign not to take economic growth for, oh. for granted. I, I think guess. you're right. I think, And I, I do think that one of the things that economic history teaches economists is to be much more humble. <laughs> um, we, we do as economists, we tend to be quite optimistic about the future of economic growth. But when you look at the when you look at the past and you see how often economic growth has come to an end, that does lead you to be more humble. And also things like technology. As economists, we have a very optimistic view about technology and how it will solve all of our problems. And again, if you look uh, into past history, you see how technology doesn't always provide solutions and can sometimes bring downsides as well as upsides. And inequality is another thing. I mean, until relatively recently, we thought that as the economy grew, that it would create a rising tide that lifted all boats. And in recent years, we've experienced um, rising inequality. But actually, if you look back over the long run of human history, and say the work of someone like Branko Milanovic, you find that there are these continual swings, these continual ups and downs in inequality that you can't take for granted that inequality is going to trend down. So I think economic history in general does teach us to be much more humble about the economy. And so that's perhaps um, a good reason for economists to um, to learn more economic history. <laughs> I think I think that's a really lovely setting out into why kind of mm -hmm. discussing economic history is really important and why the Industrial Revolution in particular is such an interesting uh, topic to discuss. So what I want to do now is going into some of the literature yeah. and discussing uh, what was it that caused the Industrial Revolution. Yeah. Then. But yeah. but just just before we kind of talk about mm -hmm. um, what kind of work has been done there, mm -hmm. I think it's important just to kind of reiterate again 
um, why it is so interesting that it was Britain as a yeah. country that kind of managed to um, find the magic formula. Because if you, you talk to somebody in the 1700s, Britain probably wouldn't be the answer. You wouldn't put your money on Britain. That's right. That's right. I mean, for, I mean, Europe in general, I'm not sure you'd put your money on Europe. We, we tend to have this idea today that the West is best economically as if it's always been, you know, going back to the ancient Greeks and possibly before. But for most of human history, Europe... The West was a backwater and all of the interesting action was taking place in, say, China, the Middle East, India and Pakistan. Um, so how um, not only Britain managed to have this industrial revolution and transform its economy and become one of the world's richest economies, but how the West in general managed to not just catch up with those other really leading um, economic regions for the majority of human history, but actually overtake them, and not just by an inch, but by a mile in many cases, is um, a really intriguing um, question. Right, and I think that kind of brings us on to our, our first factor then, about mm -hmm. what was it that kind of changed in Europe um, mm -hmm. that kind of meant that it first allowed for this uh, catch-up and then later mm -hmm. uh, this kind of great divergence mm -hmm. between uh, between Europe and, and the rest of the world. Yeah, so it's it's a question that we have been um, seeking to answer for some time now, and I'm not saying that we yet have the full answer. But what's interesting is how our understanding of that has changed. So until the last 10 years or so, our view used to be one that revolved around markets and market supporting institutions. And of course, this goes back to Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, published in the late 1700s, that argued that all you need to take an economy from poverty to prosperity is markets supported by good institutions like rule of law and um, a, a reasonable um, state that doesn't impose too high taxes and, and, and so on. And so we used to think about the rise of the West in those terms. And actually, my um, PhD, which I did at Oxford, uh, tested that market-based hypothesis and found that it was wanting, <laughs> that whilst markets are to, to a degree necessary for economic growth, they are certainly not sufficient. And actually, you can find markets in many, many parts of the world and uh, um, right across time where you don't always find um, sustained economic growth. So I think the evidence is there that that that, that um, hypothesis, that very old hypothesis really isn't enough. And so once we bash that idea on the head, then of course it opens things up to say, well, what was it? What was it that not only made Britain rich, but what made the West rich? And in the past 10 years, you've seen 101 different explanations for it. Uh, so if I think about some of the most popular ones, so Joel Mockier has an idea that it was the scientific enlightenment that made the West um, rich. And so here we're thinking about the way in which ideas, the way in which our minds can feed through to transform the economy. Uh, so the, the, the underlying gist of this is that before the Enlightenment, which took place in the late 1600s through the 1700s and, and 1800s, before the Enlightenment, we tended to look at the world as if it was driven by fate, magic, and heavenly forces. So let's say the chapel, um, um, the college chapel roof collapses, rather than blaming that on bad engineering, we would instead blame it on the gods. That the gods were punishing the vicar for a bad sermon or, or something like that. Um, and what the Enlightenment involves is, involves is a shift from seeing the world in that way to instead seeing the world as driven by the laws of science. And that it is for us as intellectuals to uncover those laws of science and to then harness that knowledge and use it to improve not just our lives, but the lives of um, everyone in society. I think one other interesting kind of related idea to that is mm -hmm. uh, one thing I think Hirschman mentioned as well. Yeah. Uh, it's not just about um, a kind of changing um, of mindset so that we're now more capable of improving our lives, but also kind of legitimizing that improvement yeah. and um, allowing people to um, seek betterment and acquire fortune and, yes. and money and all of that. I think that's really important. And actually, it relates quite nicely to um, a trilogy of books written by Deirdre um, McCluskey on bourgeois values and the, the way in which we shifted from 
seeing people who are ambitious and want to make a better life for themselves as um, as being perhaps greedy and um, seeking to advance their position too much and not accepting of their position in society. We shift away from seeing that as a negative thing to instead seeing it as, as a good thing, that we should all be aspiring to make a better life and that we don't have to accept the, the, the situation into which we are born. Um, and in particular, making money um, doesn't have to be seen in a negative way. Of course, you know, traditionally in, in, in terms of the Christianity that has dominated Europe, we've seen money as, as an evil thing. But increasingly on the eve of the Industrial Revolution, we're starting to see money as something that can create incentives. So profit as something that can incentivize businesses to provide us as consumers with what we want, warmer clothes, better food. Um, so we do start to change the way we think about ourselves as social animals, that we shouldn't just accept the position into which we're born and that striving, including through aspiring for a better job or creating your own business and making money through that, we start to see that in a more positive light. Um, I think one other interesting thing to kind of bring mm. up about the Enlightenment in our discussion is that it actually runs counter to a lot of the ways we would imagine markets working. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you want to talk about that yeah. at all? Yeah, and I think this hasn't always been developed enough, actually, in the literature. Um, so, the, so what we find with the Enlightenment is the development of scientific communities in which you have people working together almost communally. I mean, we see that in science departments in modern day universities, people working together and not for their own private interests so much, but for the good of society. So when I talk to scientists at high table and I ask them, you know, why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you hunting out this cure for cancer? Or why are you trying to find a better battery? then typically they are driven not by the desire to make money for themselves, but to solve an environmental problem by creating a, a better battery. Or they, um, they want to lessen um, the number of cases of cancer you know, in, in society. So we see intellectuals working together communally rather than competitively and for the common good rather than for their own private interest. So I do think there is something about this enlightenment-based view of the rise of the West that does run to a degree counter to that more traditional market-based um, view of, of growth. That's, that's really interesting. But I think um, we, we'd both agree as well that mm. there's a lot of issues kind of with this kind of enlightenment um, idea. Yeah. I mean, one obvious question that kind of comes to mind is, OK, so we know the enlightenment was caused, but, you know, caused the Industrial Revolution. Yeah. But what was that caused it in turn? Yeah, yeah. And and I think one of the things that people are left a bit uncomfortable with, with this enlightenment idea is is how do we then reflect on the rest of the world? You know, mm. is the other side of the coin to this that the rest of the world was unenlightened? And that's quite an indictment, you know, of the rest of the world. And I think Joel Mokia has had to walk a careful tightrope <laughs> when it comes to this. And so his first book, Enlightened Economy, has been followed up much more recently, a couple of years ago, by a new book called um, Culture of Growth, in which he argues that the reason why Europe had this very successful enlightenment compared with, say, China, is that it was divided into multiple competing states, multiple competing nations. And he argues that meant that if any single nation turned against science, they started to, say, persecute intellectuals and crack down on intellectual freedom, then intellectuals could move elsewhere. So you had no single a state operating over the whole of Europe that could turn out the lights on science in a way that he argues did happen to a degree in the Middle East and in China. So we're almost then, he's almost then taking this into, into the area of saying it's not really that those other regions were less scientifically able, it actually then turns to the politics, um, the political side of things of, uh, as being um, one of the important differences. And I guess in, in many ways, Europe being fractured would often be seen as a disadvantage yeah. in a lot of ways. But in this case, it was actually something yeah. that, that helped it. Yeah, that's right. So in terms of markets and something that that was found in that was something I found in, in my PhD and in my first book, that that the way in which Europe is divided into these multiple states results in tariffs and tolls and is not good 
for trade. And, you know, the European Union has gone a long way, actually, in continuing the process of pulling down those divisions between economies. But the other thing also that we've seen with the European Union is freedom of movement, um, freedom of movement for intellectuals included. And so here in Cambridge, you know, we, we have plenty of people from across the EU working in our science departments and so on. Um, and um, so I think it is possible to have a situation in which you can be both getting the benefits of the market, but at the same time have that freedom of movement that's necessary for people to be able to move around to where people are interested in their science, where people respect their science, and where as a society we can benefit from that. And that's actually a, a really lovely link by mm. kind of pointing out that the Enlightenment was an international phenomenon. Yes. Whereas the Industrial Revolution um, was a British. a British phenomenon, exactly. Yeah. And then I guess the question kind of comes, okay, yeah. if the Enlightenment was so important, um, but, you know, I, as a German, I, I'd like to mention as well, uh, you yeah. know, you had the Aufklärung and, and all of oh, that as well. Yes. Um, why was it that the Industrial Revolution happened in Britain yeah. and not in another European Really country? good question. Um, so Mokia highlights a couple of things. So one of the things he argues is that British science was, in his view, more practical, um, more applied less um, cut off in the ivory towers than some continental countries. And the second thing he argues is that in Britain you had more mechanical, practical skills. And, and, and what you had was the coming together of scientists um, who have an idea with um, mechanically skilled engineers, for example, who could turn that idea into a working machine. And importantly, business people who could see the profit in using that machine. Um, and that, that in turn, that coming together of the science, the practical skill, and the business side of things actually meant that the Enlightenment uh, paid off, in a sense, more quickly in Britain than in other parts of Europe. But though, ultimately, I think what's interesting about um, Mockier's argument is ultimately he's saying that Europe would have had the Industrial Revolution without Britain. If Britain had sunk into the Atlantic Ocean, if that had been the end of us, that because the Enlightenment was going on across Europe, somewhere else would have soon had an Industrial Revolution. That, that Britain is not necessary for the Industrial Revolution. But that's not everybody's view, is it? You're right, you're right. So that brings me to another uh, popular and competing view of the Industrial Revolution, which is that it is driven by um, high wages in Britain combined with cheap coal. And this is the view of a book published around the same time as Joel Mockier's book um, by uh, Bob Allen, who interestingly supervised me for my PhD in Oxford. Full disclosure. <laughs> Full disclosure. So I might, I might be biased here. And so what he argues is the scientific enlightenment, the scientific revolution is necessary but it's not sufficient, that it's all very well having an active um, and dynamic science, moving science frontier. But if you have a cheap labor economy, that businesses are not incentivized to take that science and the technology that comes from it and embody it in the production process in a way that will raise productivity and create economic growth. So Alan argues that what's particular, what's relatively unique about Britain is that we had a high wage economy and that incentivized businesses to seek out uh, more mechanized production processes embodying this science and technology. And at the same time that we had an abundant supply and therefore a cheap supply of coal. And coal was the way that you ran machinery through steam engines, for example. And so, so that meant that running machinery was cheap whilst using labor was expensive. And so you go down that more mechanized route. So as far as Alan's concerned, the Industrial Revolution happened in Britain because it was profitable for it to happen in Britain because we were a high wage economy with cheap coal. So for Alan, compared with Mokia, for Alan, if Britain had sunk into the Atlantic Ocean, then that would have been the end to European growth. <laughs> that the Britain in the phrase British Industrial Revolution is really important, whereas for Mokia it's not. And then I guess once those ideas kind of get developed and the technology gets made cheaper, mm. that is then when it later comes to a point where other European countries exactly. can adopt it as well. Yeah, so, so you get a series of 
think of micro improvements to these machines and to steam engines and so on that eventually make them profitable to use. Um, even if you're a cheap labor economy, still it can tip in the balance of, um, of, of adopting those machines once they've been improved to the point that they become relatively cheap themselves. And I, I think that mm. argument makes a lot of intuitive sense, arguing mm. that kind of high wages are a really important factor mm. here. But uh, as you've pointed out, that is very much a, an incomplete argument as well, because then the question is, OK, Britain uh, had the Industrial Revolution because it had high wages. But why did it have high wages? Yeah, I mean, let me let me just say to begin with that in the past couple of years or so, a big debate has started to rage on the degree to which Britain really was a high wage economy compared with some other parts of Europe. Um, it's one of the most active debates in economic history at the moment. And the, the way I think about this is probably the direction that we might end up going is to say that there are some other parts of Europe where you also have relatively expensive labor, but that still enables us to explain how the West grew rich. Uh, it might not enable us to explain why Britain first, but how the West in general rich and also the policy lesson that comes from that is that um, if you are a cheap labor economy there is a limit to your ability to to keep on growing and and I think that's very important for some poor economies today um, so yeah so there is a debate raging about the extent to which Britain's high wage economy was unique to Britain versus um, the rest of Europe. But in terms of um, explaining that relatively expensive labor, let's say in Europe compared with other parts of the world, typically the way that's been done is by thinking about the demand for labor. So Alan looks at Britain's um, increasing involvement in world trade in the 1600s and argued that as Britain got more involved in trade, so you can imagine those very active port cities with ships coming in from across the world and all the goods that they carry being unloaded and all the demand that creates for um, people to service those ships, to, um, to navigate those ships, to, um, to wholesale all those products that are coming off the ships. And so he argues that that high demand for labor fed through to create a high wage economy. Now, I think that you've got a lot of international trade going on in many parts of the world where you still have a cheap labor economy. So I prefer instead to think about the supply side of labor and where does labor come from? Labor comes from the wombs of women. And so I think there we have to think about the dynamics of um, fertility and how that might have fed through the supply of labor to affect um, wages in the economy. And I think that's also important to point out that that is an aspect of economics that often gets overlooked. It does. It does. Absolutely. Um, it's interesting that the, our, our overall story of the Industrial Revolution is a very male one. You know, we think about important male figures like uh, James Watt, um, Arkwright, um, Brunel, scientists like um, Newton, you know, it is a very male story. And we look at the Industrial Revolution from a male point of view. So this scientific enlightenment, for example, all very well if you're a man, but if you were a woman, you were locked out of that. You were not allowed to be part of the scientific societies. And in terms of this high wage economy, that was much more a feature of male labor than it was a female labor. Women typically paid half the amount that men were paid. And also, I should say, if you're thinking about immigrant labor as well, because immigrant labor often didn't have access to that high wage um, economy either. So I think this is about a story of the Industrial Revolution, whether you're looking at the Enlightenment view or the high wage view that is very much told through um, male eyes. Right, so then I guess the, the question is, OK, let's talking uh, about mm -hmm. European fertility and what was it that made that special and, and why is it that uh, yeah. that kind of distinguishes it from, from yeah. other countries? So historical demographers going back to Hatchnell, um, who was writing around about the 1960s, have argued that Europe was relatively unique in terms of having restrained fertility and that restrained fertility came in the form of of a high age of marriage. So 
If you look in Britain in the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, the average age that a British woman got married at that time was 25 or 26, which is really quite high. You compare that with many poor countries today where you have high rates of child marriage and it really does st um, stand out. Um, uh, sorry, and, and, and just to clarify, yeah. why does it mean that if women get mm. married le at a later age, why good does point. that mean we've got high wages? Good, good the point. So in the modern day... Um, having babies and being married and not necessarily connected. You know, you can have babies outside of marriage and if you're married, you can take birth control and you can avoid having babies. Um, but at the time, it's a time when births outside of marriage were sadly not seen as socially acceptable and where there was a lack of reliable birth control and therefore there was a strong connection between the age at which women got married and the number of children that they would go on to have in their lives. So this, what's called the European marriage pattern, which involves this high age of marriage for women and also actually a high celibacy rate for women. So 10 to 15% of women not marrying. Um, so, so, that, so you have a degree of freedom for women to choose not to marry, which I think is um, a very important thing. And some, sometimes we, we fail to appreciate the importance of that. Um, you know, this is rel seems relatively unique um, to Europe and could have fed through to affect the economy in quite interesting ways, including the, the wage in the economy. Um, and are there any theories out there as to why that was the case? As to, I mean, I, it's always yeah. a question of like asking why and why again. Yeah, no, no, um, I, I, but, I like why questions. I, um, <laughs> I like why questions. So the European marriage pattern, again, it is quite an active research area right now. What are mm. the origins of, of this high age of marriage for women? Uh, one of the most popular explanations um, that's been put forward by economic historians like Jan Luton van Zanden, Tyne de Moore, Votlander and Voth in their paper is that the Black Death might have had a, um, had a quite a radical effect on the way families work. So the Black Death actually occurred in the year my college was first founded, 1348, <laughs> and it wiped out between a third and a half of the population, so created a real shortage in the labour market a shortage of labor. So there are various mechanisms through which that might have fed through to create more opportunities for women in the labor market. Um, so um, what happens then as women have the ability to take jobs and actually earn money is that they then have the bargaining power to stand up to the traditional family system in which they are being married off, in which they're seen as a financial burden and being married off at a young age. Um, so women, um, because they can go out and earn, are then able to take charge of the marriage decision for themselves to decide for themselves whether, who, and when to marry. And if they do decide to get married, then because they are used to earning and having their own freedom, then they want to set up their own independent household. They don't want to be absorbed into their parents-in-law's household and live for the rest of their lives in their parents-in-law. And, and so the, the result of this um, women's freedom to work is that um, couples have to delay marriage until they can afford to set up their own independent households. So we have this high age of marriage that, that results. And I think that kind of is interesting as well because it kind of links into an idea Malthus has been talking mm. about before as well, yes. about um, correlating income and fertility. Yes. Do, you, do you want to talk yes, about that so at all? that's right. So, so Malthus had this idea that there are two potential checks on population, the positive check and the preventive check. The positive check actually isn't that positive <laughs> <laughs> because the positive check is the grizzly one. So that is the way in which as the population overexpands, that that creates mass starvation. And then people's, so, so mortality rises and that then pulls the population back down in line with the economy's ability to support it. Um, so that's quite a grisly way of making sure that the population and the economy stay in line with one another, the positive check. But he did suggest an alternative, and that is the preventive check, which is where the population stays in line with the economy through fertility behavior. So if the economy starts to get poorer, people then delay marriage, fewer babies are then born, and that helps to 
um, keep the population more in line with, with, with the situation in the economy. Whereas if the economy gets richer, people can afford to get married younger, more babies are born, and we have uh, a bigger population to meet those um, the, the, the greater economic um, resources in the economy. Um, so that is I mean, it's this kind of situation of tough love because we're talking about how you can't get married and have kids unless the economy is allowing you to. But at the same time, it's a less grisly way of keeping population in line with economic resources than the alternative he had, which was the positive check, which involves people literally starving to death until population is back in line. Although I think just to clarify, I might be wrong here, but Malthus himself didn't talk about preventative checks being um, linked to fertility and stuff. He so, was... so he talked about abstinence. Mm. So he uh, he recommended that couples um, through practicing abstinence um, could control their fertility behavior. What he wasn't a fan of was birth control, interestingly. Um, so he didn't believe that cu couples should be able to have sex without experiencing the consequences of <laughs> pregnancy, the pain of pregnancy and the babies that would come um, come with it. Um, so, so, yeah, uh, it's, I think it's just just uh, good to kind of explore that area yeah. as well. So um, we've kind of seen now um, how um, the European marriage pattern yeah. is important for high wages. But I think it's also interesting to note that there is a whole bunch of other channels that it might benefit yeah. an economy through. Yeah, yeah. And and here I should say that I think about this as not so much just being the European marriage pattern, but more generally the women's freedom mm. that kind of underpins it that might, as you say, feed through to actually affect the economy in other interesting ways as well. So in my new book, The Sex Factor, How Women Made the West Rich, I talk about five different channels through which women's freedom might um, help to lay the foundations for growth in the economy. So one of those which relates to what we're talking about is how women's freedom creates these smaller families, less population pressure, and so a higher wage economy that incentivizes mechanization in the economy. And so with it, um, investment and R&D and so on. The second thing is that with smaller families, you can um, better afford to save. And so that provides funds for the wider economy to, to fund the investment that's going on in the economy. A third way is the way in which with the smaller families, you can better afford to spend on each child. You can better afford to educate your children. And so that feeds through to create the skill base. Now, of course, in Mockier's argument about the scientific um, enlightenment, he talks about how what was important about Britain is you had those practical skills you had practically trained la apprenticeship trained labor such as clockmakers who had the skills that could turn scientific ideas into working working machines so perhaps actually at the root of that is um, is women's freedom and how that affected um, the skill base of the economy and another important thing is also um, what we find with women's freedom and the European marriage pattern is that you cannot get married and have a family unless you can afford to which means that as a young person if you want to have an intimate relationship and if you want to have a family life you have to work really hard from a young age to save to train yourself up so you can get yourself into a financially viable position now um, Max Weber has argued that there is this thing in Europe called the Protestant work ethic that brought that about and, and puts that down to religion I would instead say actually that women's freedom and the European marriage pattern is creating that entrepreneurship if you like that hard work that saving that entrepreneurship and the final channel that I talk about in my book is the way in which women's freedom um, was reflected, came to be reflected on um, political institutions. So there is a whole um, history of arguing that political institutions, particularly democratic institutions, helped to support market development in Europe, including, say, in Britain, we had the 1688 glorious revolution that wrestled control away from the monarch and put it in the hands of an elected parliament. And the argument is that that helps secure property rights. And um, with that, we get um, better developed markets that people are secure in, in their property, secure in the knowledge that they can keep what they produce, then have an incentive to build businesses and trade and um, 
and so on. Um, now, I would um, it, I would add to that by saying that um, where families are patriarchal, where women lack freedom and families are patriarchal, we grow up from a very young age with the view that we need to shut up rather than speak up. You know, the, the patriarch, the eldest male in the family is in charge. And actually, whether you're a young woman or a young man, you really don't have the freedom to question, to hold him to account. And so you're not nurturing the types of practices and behaviors that are necessary for a democratic population. Whereas families that um, are based on higher levels of gender equality, where we can speak up rather than shut up, where we can hold each other to account, we can argue, we can disagree. With that, you can see how that would nurture a population that is both more demanding of democracy and can, in a democratic system, hold the leaders to account. So I do think that there is a sense in which patriarchy and autocracy stand and fall together. And you see that in the 17th century in Britain, when we're having this debate around the time of the Glorious Revolution, um, the, this, this big step in the direction of democracy, where the defenders of the king are saying to the men across the country, if you um, knock the king off his pedestal, what does that do to the situation of every father in his family? That you destabilize the, the rule of the king and you destabilize the rule of every patriarch within, within his family. Mm. That's, that's really interesting. And I think just to kind mm. of clarify as well, we're by no means um, saying that um, Britain or, or Europe yeah. in general was anywhere more pr progressive, yeah. um, but it was relatively more progressive Rel than, yeah, than yeah. other parts so of the So certainly world. the situation was definitely not perfect, and I would much rather be a modern-day woman <laughs> <laughs> than I would be a woman living in the 1400s, 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, or even the Industrial Revolution. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we're talking in relative terms that actually that that difference. And you do find when you look, for example, at the age of marriage of women in, say, China mm. on the eve of the Industrial Revolution um, and the Middle East, that you have a much lower age of marriage for women. And you also have women are all expected to marry men, you know, mm. whether they like men or not, they are married off from a young age. And so you have relatively little freedom. And I do think that that feeds through to affect wages in the economy, skills, investment, uh, political institutions either reinforcing or resisting yeah. um, anti-democratic practices and possibly entrepreneurship, as I've said as well. And there are obviously lessons as well from these channels you've identified and uh, women's rights more generally for modern economic growth. Yes, that's right. Um, so my, my own view is that women's freedom needs to come first, not last. So I think as economists, we have a tendency to argue, get the economy right, and then social freedoms will follow. If you get the economy right, then we will become less racist, less, less sexist, less homophobic. Um, and I think actually, we need to sometimes think about this the other way around. Economists are not very good at doing that, because they like to see all social change as rooted in economic change. It's economy that feeds through to affect society and culture. But I think what we find when we look at British history um, is that women's freedom began before the Industrial Revolution and then paved the way for the rise of the economy. And that without at least a minimal level of women's freedom, and you could think more generally about you know, the, the freedom of minority groups in the economy, but without that minimal level, your economy will hit a wall. Um, so my advice to um, politicians and policymakers in poor economies, if they want to um, improve their economies, is to look what's going on within their own home. Look at the way they treat their wives and their daughters. And there you might find the answer to some of the um, causes of poverty in in their countries. Um, and, and there are any examples that you could point to um, of countries yeah. that managed to get it right in, I guess, the more more modern day setting? Yeah. Um, so um, if we look at China, um, in the last 30 or 40 years, it's been probably the most successful in terms of sustaining economic growth and actually much more rapid growth than we had mm -hmm. in Britain in the Industrial Revolution. We're talking about 
growth of almost 10% per annum over 30 or 40 years. I mean, this is remarkable. This has virtually never happened. I, like, I, I guess just to before, compare to the Industrial Revolution, yeah. what kind of percentages oh, were we talking about? It, it's in, whilst, whilst growth rates in the Industrial Revolution were much higher than they had been before, we're talking about 0.5% per annum, <laughs> um, maximum 1% per annum. So if we're comparing that with China, who is achieving 10% per annum for 30 or 40 years, it really is remarkable. Um, now, I do think that one of the interesting things that distinguishes China from many other um, poorer countries, say in the 1970s, when, when China was um, just before its, its big growth spurt, is that China has um, gone a long way to limit population growth in its economy and to create um, opportunities for women in the economy. You know, it is the norm for women to work alongside um, men. So there isn't, um, I mean, whilst there is still a degree of gender inequality, and you can see that reflected in sex-selective abortions and things like that, I'm not saying it's perfect, but compared with, um, if we look at um, some other economies in South Asia, if we look in Africa, where we find much more rapid population growth, women um, sometimes married off at a young age and then responsible for multiple children. Um, I do think we have quite a different situation in, in China. Now, I wouldn't recommend China's approach to population growth, which is a very heavy handed one and violates everything I believe in terms of individual rights and individual freedom. You know, I'm a feminist. I am passionate about freedom. I would never welcome a state trampling on my ability to determine for myself how many children I want to have. But I do think that at the same time, it shows that there are benefits for an economy in which population growth is, um, is not as rapid as in some other poorer countries and in which women have the, the, uh, um, the ability to participate in the wider economy and the workforce. I would probably recommend quite a different approach to the one China has followed. I think if you can, and if you can underpin women's rights through access to education, access to jobs, access to birth control, which is still something that women really struggle to access in many of today's poor countries, then you can go a long way to, to both... Um, making sure that population growth doesn't get out of control and making sure that women are able to make decisions that not just benefit themselves, but that benefit the wider economy. Um, I should say that if you look across the whole world today, one in five young women is married by the time they're 18. 44% uh, of pregnancies are unintended, unplanned. So we still have a long way to go in terms of making sure that women are free enough to take charge of the marriage decision, decide for themselves whether, who and when to marry, and that women are able to take charge of their own fertility. And, and those are all like goals very much worthy in their own right. But as we've kind of discussed um, mm. so far, it's very interesting that it can often go hand in hand with with economic growth as well. Mm. Although the relationship um, is very yes, much still being being researched yeah, and yeah, um, that's right. being that's kind of right. been clarified. Um, so I was thinking another country that might be an interesting example of what you're talking about is Rwanda. Can you tell me more? Yes, more yes. So it's such an interesting country and has been in recent history one of the more successful um, African economies. There are interesting parallels between Rwanda and the Black Death that we've been talking about in Europe. So there was a big population collapse in Rwanda as a result of, very sadly, a, a genocide um, that took place there. Um, and so that resulted in a real scarcity of labor in, in a way that happened in Europe um, after the Black Death. And what you saw with that is women being pulled into what had previously been quite masculine areas. And interestingly, that includes politics. So Rwanda is up there in terms of having one of the most gender equal parliaments in, in the world, uh, close to 50-50. In fact, some years has more women than men in parliament, which we here in Britain haven't yet managed to achieve. So I think there are interesting parallels between Rwanda and um, what we're talking about in regard to Britain in terms of women's um, engagement with the labour market, with politics, 
um, and women's freedom more generally and how that seems to provide a foundation for um, economic growth. Um, I'm, I'm thinking as well, I'm, I'm not sure how, how relevant it is um, in kind of the context that we're talking about as well, but there's a lot of studies out there as well showing the effects that female suffrage has on public health spending yes, um, and yes. kind of prioritising issues that tend to be de-emphasised or get lost yeah. when it's just men talking about it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So you do find that um, economists tend to assume that outside of the home we are all selfish and greedy, self-interested individuals and that within the home we're all altruistic and we all make choices that are good for one another as a family and actually what Marxist feminism in particular has revealed is that often self-interest uh, um, commands within the home and and you have a bargaining power struggle between man and wife and where men are earning more than women that gives them more power within the household and affects the types of of goods and services that households spend their money on and what you find is when you rebalance that um, the income between man and wife and with it the bargaining power you find families tend to then spend on things like education and the health care of the children things that then turn out to be good not only for the children but actually for for, for the wider economy as well thank you very much dr bateman that was a, a really interesting discussion i guess uh, the last question i have just to kind of round up uh, the interview is asking if you've got any uh, three recommendations about books or papers or films or anything oh, yes, that uh, listeners could uh, get inspired I, with i will limit myself to three books um one um i think a really important one um overlooked by economists is by ruth mazo Karras, and it's called common women and it actually looks at um, sexuality and the lives of sex workers in medieval and early modern um, Britain. And I think there's, there's a lot that we can gain there in terms of social attitudes to women in general, not just to sex workers. Uh, another one, Gender and Economics, which is a compilation by Jane Humphreys, who is one of the leading professors in economic history at the University of Oxford. Now, it's quite an old book now, um, but it, what it does mean is that it, it is great to refer to that as a compilation of many now classic papers and chapters in particularly feminist economics. So it was written, I think, in the 1990s, uh, pulled together as a collection, really, of, of um, feminist economic um, writings um, up to that point, a really, really good um, source. And another book I'd recommend is by Nancy, Nancy Fober, and it's Greed, Lust and Gender. And this, in many ways, reflects on the history of economic thought and economist neglect of women within that. Of course, economics was, modern economics was born in the period just after the Industrial Revolution. And what's really interesting about the Industrial Revolution is whilst, as I've argued, um, women's freedom helped to lay the foundations for the Industrial Revolution, the Industrial Revolution didn't initially pay back women in return. Actually, with the Industrial Revolution came a retreat out of the labor market by women and that's in part because agriculture becomes more mechanized and more muscle power based heavy industry things like mining and iron and steel develop and push women out of the labor market so by the time economists are starting to get together and create their subject in the late 19th century you by that point then have um, the male breadwinner model the idea that a man's role is to work and a woman's role is to be a housewife. And that wall that was created between what was seen as the public sphere and the private sphere, or between the formal economy and society, if you like, was then reflected in economists' um, thinking. And you think about the types of assumptions economists make, that we're all self-interested, independent, calculating, rational beings. Um, and how resistant economists have been to relaxing those assumptions, to bringing in dependency, emotions, 
and so on because economists see those things as feminine and therefore as unworthy, as soft. We think about the way economists have designed the, their measures for the economy, things like GDP, um, the, the measure of the output of an economy that includes things traditionally made by men, but not, say, work that takes place within the home that is making a significant contribution to the economy, the childcare, the reproductive labor, and so on, um, but has been ignored by many um, economists. Um, so, so Nancy Fobra's book is quite interesting because it connects together some of these issues of um, women's freedom and reflects on uh, the history of economic thought in that regard. That's really great. And those are, I think, three amazing book recommendations that I think I've got to add to my reading list as well. Yes. And uh, I'll say as well to all the listeners uh, that you've got your own book out as well, uh, The Sex Factor, uh, for anybody uh, interested in finding thank out more you. about the ideas that we've kind of touched upon. But um, thank Dr. You. Bateman, thank you so much. My pleasure. That was Dr. Victoria Bateman on the Industrial Revolution. If you want to learn more about Dr. Bateman's research and economic history generally, you can read the write-up that accompanies every episode at hearthisidea.com forward slash episodes forward slash Victoria. There you will find a summary of our conversation as well as links to Dr. Bateman's book recommendations, all the articles referenced and other further readings. If you have a minute, we would also greatly appreciate it if you could leave us a review on iTunes or whatever platform you are hearing us from. We're just starting out, so any advice helps improve the show and others find out about us. If you want to support the show more directly, you can also leave a tip by following the link in the description. Thank you for listening.